organizations, communities, business, and governments. A collective network that hopes to save more life and change more minds in humanitarian development. Please join me to welcome our honorable speaker, Mr. El Haj Asi, Secretary General of IFRC. Good afternoon. Thank you for being with us today, Mr. Asi. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Uh, Mr. Asi, uh, you are the Secretary General of the IFRC, or International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, a network that is made up of 190 National Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. So what is it that drives you in what must be a very demanding role? Yeah, thank you very much. I think the uh, key central word in working uh, in humanitarian settings and then working with the Red Cross is the simple word of humanity. Mm. The humanity we share, no matter where we are from, no matter where we live, the humanity that is also gathering so many people who are waking up every day in a very difficult circumstances, developing strategies for survival to care for themselves and for their loved ones. Mm. And people facing so many hardships. And uh, nowadays, unfortunately, more than ever before, since the Second World War, have we ever seen so many people in need of humanitarian assistance. 100 million today in acute needs. Since the Second World War, have we seen so many people who are forced to leave home because home is no longer safe. 65 million of them. Since the Second World War, have we seen so many people on the move, migrants and refugees combined, 125 million. Mm. When we try to describe the situation, of course, we use these big numbers of millions of people, but behind each unit, there is a human being, there is a person, there is a mother, a father, a son and a daughter who is uh, facing multiple deprivations and trying to recover what is most important to them, which is their human dignity. And that is that shared humanity that is calling on us, that is this pursuit of that human dignity that is motivating us to work alongside the principles of our movement of the Red Cross and Red Crescent to respond to the needs. All right, so you have served in many areas in the world, and uh, you must be facing a lot of different uh, situations in different areas. So uh, what do you think is the major humanitarian challenges that we're facing today? I think the uh, most uh, challenging uh, uh, humanitarian settings that we see today is the fact that crises are getting more and more protracted. We hardly remember when conflict started but they still are going on. Mm -hmm. So who remembers you know, when the invasion of Iraq was, but they're still going on? Who remembers the wars in Afghanistan that is still going on? We had the same situation in South Sudan, you know, that the civil war that ended with independence and just some weeks ago, here we are again all over. So I remember working in Syria uh, four years ago and then we were talking about maybe the last winter at that time that we will have to care for the children. Here we are five winters later still going on without a perspective of finding a solution. I think what is now very critical is that political problems are not finding political solutions. So that is then putting so many people in need and we have to deal with the consequences of that. On the other hand, we are living out at a time when a combination of unplanned urbanization as far as and climate change mm. is uh, putting a region like this one, which is very prone to natural disasters, now more recurrent in our type of shocks that are related to natural hazards that are putting so many people you know, at risk. Now, we've never faced, we've never faced so many challenges as far as humanitarian assistance is concerned. So the efforts that are being put by all the actors are tremendous, all the way from individuals to private sector to United Nations humanitarian organization. But those efforts combined are not anywhere near the magnitude and the scale of the problem. So that means something extremely important. Unless we reduce the needs that will are pushing so many people now in situation of deprivation, we will not be able to cope. Now, in the longer term, we have to make sure that, of course, in the acute circumstances, we will have to respond and respond quickly mm. 
-hmm. and effectively, but on the other end, everything else has to be done so that disaster risk reduction become a reality for natural hazards, so that also political solution be found to conflicts to reduce the number of people in need. Do you have any um, most memorable, compelling stories that you find in remote areas, for example, that you can share with us so that we can learn um, about the real situations of humanitarian development in the world today? I think across the world, in the most remote areas, there is one thing which is very constant. Before any uh, organization come to the humanitarian scene or to try to develop a response, these are the people, the indigenous people themselves, who are the first humanitarian responders. These are the poorest of the poor, most of the time, that are hosting you know, those refugees that are coming. Mm -hmm. It is the poorest mother who shares you know, the last grain they have in their house, or even taking the clothes off their own body to wrap you know, the baby who's in the cold or in the heat, and you know, providing that hospitality. Now, if we talk about humanitarian response, and then the shared humanity that I started with, that's what we find in communities, that we find in families, that we find in villages. And that is the source of inspiration that we need to build on. Nowadays, you know, there is a growing recognition of the local actors and their importance to make a difference, particularly in the very first hours of the needs. But the very local actors are those in the local communities that are responding. And that's where we see the best in human beings next to the worst, unfortunately. The best in human beings in terms of solidarity, in terms of respect, in terms of sharing, in terms of generosity. So in the most difficult circumstances, you can even see beauty. You know, in the most difficult, hard, hardest situation, you will see generosity. When people are lost and then have lost everything, they share even the last, you know, they have. And that is a true lesson of humanity. But that is also in those very situations that you see that people are trafficked, that women are abused, that children are abused and then violated. And all that you know, we see next to each other. There are always those who will be part of the problem and those mm. who are lucky to want to be part of the solution. And that is what humanitarian action is about. And of course, it is not only about helping and supporting, but it is about also respecting. It is about accompanying. It's about trusting. It's about helping people to recover what is most important to them, once again, which is their human dignity. Human dignity. Um, have you ever felt that the world is not responded enough? That uh, we need to do something more progressive, more radical, and what is that? I think we can do more and better in many instances. The UN uh, last year was estimating that we needed 20 billion US dollars to respond to the humanitarian needs. Mm -hmm. So it was hardly funded, you know, half which is then uh, a shortfall of almost $10 billion you know, to respond effectively. But even uh, in those uh, very half, first half, there are those who are hardest to reach and that are most vulnerable, that you know, deserve you know, the greatest attention. And it is not so evident that there are those very ones you know, that where people will be thinking about first. Hence the need again to emphasize you know, the importance of local actors and then the situation also forces us a certain degree of humility that none of us alone will be able you know, to make the difference that is required. Hence the importance of partnership mm -hmm. and the importance of collaboration. You know, partnership you know, between private sector and the public sector, you know, learning to understand each other better and also uh, complementing each other in terms of skills and in information, particularly if we have to reach the others to reach. I believe you know, no matter how we define ourselves, public or private sector, we may have something in common, which is a basis that we want to do good and do good for humanity. We want to reach people either with our products, we want to reach them with information, we want to reach them with assistance, and all of that you know, bring us together you know, to create that enabling environment which is good for business, but also which is good for humanity, simply put. Do good for everyone by everyone as well. All the stakeholders must be in one sentence or one uh, voice. Is it hard to achieve that? 
Yes, it is hard, you know, because again, um, it, it, is, it is not easy, you know, witnessing, you know, the others, you know, trying to find words, you know, in situations when words have no meaning, you know, being also as helpless as anybody else, you know, uh, to try to console, you know, a woman who just lost three children and um, trying to also soothe all those wounds, many of them are invisible, and you know, standing in the middle of ruins, you know, like in beautiful cities, once, once beautiful cities like Homs in Syria, that uh, totally destroyed, and then try to communicate hope, you know, to people who have seen so much, you know, that uh, prevent them from having that hope. You know, trying also to uh, give a future and a perspective to children who have seen many things that a child should not have never seen you know, in his or her life. And all those are the very difficult you know, circumstances that remind us, you know, the battlefields you know, of the history where then we had to reach out you know, to the wounded and the dying soldiers. Unfortunately today, that battlefield is everywhere. It is on the streets, it is in our cities. It is also not only performed by you know, those conventional type of uh, armed group that we used to see, but all the conventional ones, including you know, the militant forces, the terror attacks, and that is the difficulty that we face. But it is exactly in those difficult times that we are needed more than ever before. And that difficulty should no way be a paralysis. It should be a moment of reflection and a source of further motivation to partner, to hold to each other, to support each other you know, and to respond again you know, through that humanity that we share that will be our source of motivation. Okay, so every day when you wake up, when you know that you have to deal with all these problems, what do you say to yourself in order to make you have more spirit and um, ready to solve the problems? Well, we remember also many times you know, those situations where with a direct action, you could make a difference in the life you know, of people. Mm. That um, seeing almost an agonizing baby that we had tried to recuperate in a nutrition center, and then three weeks later, you know, running up and down and laughing and playing you know, like every other child. Mm -hmm. And that smile on the face of a child is something that will you know, never leave you, that will always remind you that it's you know, worth it. It is also you know, to see as I said, in the most destitute you know, areas, to see you know, people that just have one loaf of bread in their home, but standing out and sharing it you know, with others, and then bring back you know, the hope and the connection you know, with the people that is you know, telling you, well, you know, it is worth it. It is also reminding you that it is not only about providing people with food or with water, all of that is extremely important, but you know, you can remind, you can just think of, you know, proud fathers and mothers who used to care for themselves and overnight are reduced to beneficiaries of humanitarian assistance and then feel that shame, you know, to be supported and a shame to be fed, you know, by others. But then given an opportunity and within weeks, you know, they start their own business, you know, selling, you know, stuff and then start caring for themselves and recovering at the same time their pride and then their pride, you know, as a, a breadwinner, their pride as somebody who's taking care of for themselves and for their children. And there are hundreds and then thousands of examples like that that keep going. But for us again, what must keep us going every day is we're not alone. There are 17 million volunteers in all the communities in 190 countries in the world who every day are doing that kind of a work and that remind us that we are this big family of humanitarian workers that have to keep on you know, making this investment which is truly, truly worth it. That's wonderful. Um, I read this in an article. You said that you have a simple principle in your life. It says, be there at all times at the side of people and accompany them to respond to their needs. Be adjustable, but also be yourself. What do you mean by that? Yeah, indeed. You know, we are the kind of organization that do not need to go into a community when there is a shock and then get out when the shock is over. Mm. And that is uh, the kind of interventionistic you know, type of approach that we are not. We are rather 
embedded in those communities. Those 17 million volunteers I've talked about, they come from the same communities that are affected. When there is a shock, the shock finds them there. When the shock is over, the shock leaves them there. When we have the Ebola epidemic in uh, uh, West Africa, our volunteers were there, e Ebola found them. They accompany the communities to respond to a disease that they did not know. They had to do a work that they were not prepared for, which is doing a safe and dignified burial you know, of people with disease of, a, of uh, this uh, disease of this disease that did not have any cure at that time. And we were not prepared to do that. And this was one of the few instances where you had to measure the success of your program through the number of people you bury. Because burying them in a dignified and safe way would be the same way to cut the transmission. It is also uh, when we have Zika recently, you know, that we are there and responding to the needs. That I think gives that proximity, that credibility, that trust of the, with the community to be entrusted with such a difficult work like burials, to talk about very difficult issues like sexual behaviors, mm -hmm. to talk about issues like you know, taking care of orphan children. And that is why it is important to be there permanently on the side of those communities in need to accompany them you know, to respond to the needs. And we do that with respect. And with the respect, you build the trust. And with the trust, then you have the credibility and of course, with the credibility, you have a greater effect you know, in the kind of a, a, a response and the kind of results that we would like to achieve. And that's what we are committed to. So uh, not to just come, but stay there until uh, the committee uh, relief uh, itself. Um, so today, the world is facing one of the problems that you've already mentioned before is about refugees, especially in the conflict areas in the Mediterranean area. So how do you see the country so far handling this problem? So we are in a very uh, peculiar situation that uh, these are the uh, poorest can some of the poorest countries in the world that host you know the biggest number of refugees. Mm. So if you take a country like uh, Lebanon, now one third of the population of Lebanon you know is uh, constituted of refugees. One third of it. There is about over a million. So if we take a country like Jordan, host about a million you know, refugees. Turkey is hosting about almost three million, you know, refugees. So we have the whole continent of Europe. You know, when a million refugees were coming in, 29 countries were almost upside down. And these are some of the richest countries, you know, in the world. And that is that kind of a really uh, distorted image that we need, you know, to correct. If I go further, you know, in the northern part of Kenya, we have a refugee camp called Dadaab. And that is the largest refugee camp in the world for over 25 years, where they have been hosting you know, Somali refugees. Now, the biggest number today in Africa we find in Ethiopia. And of all places, Chad and the Lak Chad Basin you know, is hosting about 400,000 you know, refugees. And not to talk about even closer here to home, when you look at you know, the number of uh, thousands of uh, people and migrants and refugees that may be stranded even at sea alongside you know, the Bay of Bengal and then between the different countries in the region, you know, we see that it is a global phenomenon that requires you know, a global response. But that global response can only be developed you know, from a local perspective, that supporting you know, those countries that are carrying the burden, you know, that is very, very critical. And not only focusing you know, on these new countries of destination, you know, like now it is uh, preoccupying the big headlines in Europe, for example. Okay, when you're talking about refugees, uh, you've also mentioned before that we have like one million in some area, 400,000 in some area. So we're talking about numbers here. H how do you see um, uh, the world today when they're talking about the refugees? Is it only focusing on the numbers or they actually need to uh, make or treat refugees differently? Yeah, I think, you know, there are some fundamental, you know, rights, obligations we have with our, with our refugees. People leaving home because home is no longer safe for different reasons. You know, from an international law point of view, there are those categorization of those who are running away from conflict because their life, you know, is in danger. But if we look at now the new situations where we find ourselves in, 
with a combination of climate change and recurrent natural disasters, you know, people trying to feed themselves and also developing strategies of survival that put them, you know, in a lot of risk that call upon all of us, you know, to respond to those needs of the people so that they regain, you know, their dignity. But if we do not do that, then we face a situation like the one we have today that is a big opportunity given to human traffickers, mm -hmm. to smugglers, you know, to criminals who are selling, you know, all kind of illusions, you know, to people, exploiting them themselves. Now, the response should be in different ways. First of all, you know, making, you know, the move easy. Making the move easy in terms of providing people with visa and opportunities in countries where they'd like to go and find work. Making the move easy by making, you know, the refugee uh, route safe with protection, legal protection, but also, simply put, you know, police protection. It is also informing people that they should not fall prey, you know, to those, you know, criminals, you know, that are exploiting, you know, their hardship and, you know, try to lead them in situations that can even be, you know, more dangerous, like we see so many people drowning over the Mediterranean losing their lives. Mm -hmm. So many people getting stranded, you know, on the coast in Libya. And like we have seen also, as I said, Kia closer to home in the Bay of Bengal. All of that, you know, requires a combination of protection, legal means, facilitation, as well as, of course, you know, those who are in dire needs of humanitarian assistance, that the assistance be provided, you know, in a diligent, respectful, and dignified way. Okay, how far the IFRC have uh, responded to this problem? Again, uh, if uh, the motto is to be there all the time on the side of the communities to accompany them to respond, then the shock of the hour, of course, you know, is you know, to accompany those people, particularly those that are on the move. We are one of the few organizations that are present in the countries of origin, in the countries of transit, as well as in the countries of arrival. So then we have an opportunity to provide services all along that trail, you know, that provide, you know, information to people so that they make informed decisions, that is very critical, and alongside the way also to do, you know, the necessary protection work as well as humanitarian assistance work that I was describing before. And of course, in the countries, you know, of arrival, you know, legal protection, social protection, and pr protection also of, uh, uh, most vulnerable, namely, you know, women, uh, women and girls, and then children in particular, and because we are seeing now a new phenomenon that so many unaccompanied minors, you know, are part of either the migrants or the refugees, and those are becoming, you know, the most vulnerable. So be it in camp setting as well as in informal setting, we will continue, you know, to provide, you know, that kind of, a, you know, information and, you know, that connection that is extremely important for social inclusion because movement of people and migration is shouldn't always be seen as something negative. Mm -hmm. It is also in a global and interconnected world could be a contribution and enriching each other and providing opportunities you know, for everybody you know, to grow in a world and create an enabling environment which is safer and then more tolerable for everybody. Okay, so if, when we're talking about refugees, is it only happens in the world of, for example, in the Europe area or Mediterranean area, or you see that it's actually, we also see refugees cases, uh, but maybe not exactly the same as in the one in the Europe, in other areas in the world? Yes, as I said, you know, the, the refugees in Europe, they only represent 14%. The 86%, you know, are somewhere else. The 86% are in Africa, in Asia, so in Latin America. That is the refugees in Europe, you know, that you know, are taking the limelight, you know, of today. And, you know, the European Union and European countries, you know, they say and then behave or they do not, cannot cope, you know, with that kind of a challenges. But I say one country, one single country alone, you know, like Turkey or two countries like Lebanon and Jordan, mm -hmm. together they have much more refugees than the number, the total number of refugees that are arriving in Europe. So I think most of the time, you know, people would like to stay home. If they can't, they would like to stay closer to home. Mm -hmm. If they can't, you know, they put themselves, you know, on the trail, and those people deserve, you know, the respect and the protection, and that is an obligation also 
from a humanitarian as well as international law point of view for European and other countries to stand up to those obligations and fulfill them you know, for the sake of the shared humanity. All right, so uh, now uh, turning to One Billion Coalition for Resilience, for example, is that one of the way for the IFRC to make that progressive move towards a humanitarian act? Yes, we are experiencing uh, a recurrence of uh, natural hazards, but we've learned also over time that a natural hazard does not have to become a natural disaster. We know that there will be a monsoon season every year, but why does it have to be turned into a disaster? If we are better prepared, then we can mitigate maybe the impact of it or sometimes even turn it into an opportunity. If uh, you will live in a, a seismic uh, area, then we should have a building code, and then we have, should have a disaster law that also should you know, put a certain number of infrastructure in place that will be resisting you know, the shocks you know, when they arrive. Now, we cannot always wait you know, that the shocks arrive year after year, and then we cover the growing number of people, and then so time we show that even in terms of results. So last year, there were 50,000 people affected, we could take care of them. This year, there were 100,000 people affected, so that we took care of them, which is a good coverage. But the question we should ask ourselves is, is it normal that last year we have 50,000 and then this year we have 100,000? Why should we do in a manner that instead of having the 50,000 of last year, we will have 25, mm -hmm. and you know, the year after we will have 10, and then later on we will won't have you know, anybody that will be in this design need. And that's what the resilience is about. How to build the capacity of the communities to withstand shocks when the shocks arrive, and then build their capacity also to bounce back mm -hmm. from those shocks and bounce back better, and then elevate themselves at a certain level where then when it comes next time around, they will turn it into an opportunity. And that we can do through partnership, which can do through collaboration. Again, if I look at you know, the private sector and the public sector working together mm -hmm. in building those capacity, early warning, early alert, but also that should be accompanied with early action, pre-positioning of supply so that you know, people will not lose so much time you know, in getting into what they need, and also you know, making sure you know, that uh, we uh, not only preposition the supplies in terms of goods you know, like food, water, and sanitation, but information, schools you know, for children, and protection, and have protection as a life-saving measure you know, so that we do not provide an opportunity with those criminals you know, that will be exploiting those situations with child abuse, women's abuse, and then human trafficking. And that, this One Billion Coalition for Resilience is what it is about. It is a partnership that is bringing the different organizations and partners together to see how can we, by 2025, through our joint effort, you know, build the capacity of one billion people that will lift themselves you know, out of the situation of vulnerabilities so that they can resist you know, further shock. I have no doubt that uh, we, the, the one billion is a symbolic figure, but we can you know, exceed it you know, very easily because 17 million volunteers of Red Cross, Red Crescent already you know, play a big part of it. And now with partners like the private sector, including insurance companies like Zurich Insurance, which, with which we have a, a partnership here in Indonesia, you know, for example, and in Mexico, and other UN organizations, the World Food Program, uh, UNICEF, and then OCHA working with us and connecting it to a new initiative of the UN, which is the Connecting Business Initiative. And that those are the two main initiatives that will come out of the World Humanitarian Summit. And we are very far in the implementation, and we are very optimistic that it is a number that we can exceed. That's very good news. But uh, this is something that is uh, uh, maybe a different um, approach. Uh, and then uh, why is this uh, so important, you think, to gather all um, stacks, uh, multi uh, holder, all stakeholders to uh, participate in this One Billion Coalition for Resilience? I, I think because uh, it's it for the sake of sustainability and also providing the enabling environment that will go well beyond you know, this acute response, but also building that partnership that will go beyond that and provide opportunities even for development. Because you may... Uh, remember those days where we were factoring, you know, the different types of intervention. This is a development work. 
it starts here and stops. This is a humanitarian work. Here it starts and stops. Here is a recovery work. It starts here and stops. Those lines are getting now blurrier and blurrier because there are the same people, the same people that suffered the multiple deprivations you know, that we see, you know, be it in an epidemic outbreak like you know, the Zika or Ebola. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly in that same place you know, that you have you know, situations of deprivation that can put people in, on the move. And that is in those situations of fragilities also that you have you know, the highest number of people in humanitarian assistance. Nowadays, you know, unfortunately, you know, the majority of the people in need of humanitarian assistance, they live in fragile you know, settings. And what is even making things more complicated is those fragile settings are no longer just alongside the confine of the frontiers of a country. We have those fragile situations almost everywhere. Even in the richest countries, there are fragile contexts in the suburbs of the biggest capitals in, in Europe and in the Americas. In the big cities you know, of every country, you can have you know, fragile settings, and not to talk about now the situations of wars or when you have a natural disaster like a flood or an earthquake. All that combined you know, give us situations of fragilities you know, that requires the kind of a broad-based partnership you know, that is required, and then the longer-term engagement to accompany you know, those populations. And then that partnership, you know, so that the private sector, for example, does what it can do best, which is the procurement and supply management, bringing the goods where it is required. We incentivize, you know, the economy, you know, so that people also can have, you know, their livelihood, or for those who are in the pastoral settings, you know, get back to their livestock. And also again, you know, to do it in a dignified way so that people find themselves you know, as active members of their society, contributors to their economy, and not passive recipients of humanitarian assistance. That's a very well informed um, information. Now we can uh, go on to the next question is, uh, maybe some of us here are from business sectors. Uh, you said that business cannot uh, run as usual because it has to be different than uh, before. How can the business sectors now participate in this one billion coalition for resilience? Yeah, when I think about you know, reaching to the hardest to reach and the most vulnerable, and that group you know, will be making or breaking you know, most of the programs you know, that we have. And to take just one simple example of procurement and supply management, how do we get the drugs where we need them most and then fast in an efficient way? Well, there is not one single remote village in this world that I visited where I do not find you know, a you know, bottle of a very uh, famous, you know, cold drink that is there. But somehow people find a ways to getting it. But, you know, if you need the drug, you know, that is an essential drug that will be saving lives, you know, to that very communities, then you struggle to get it there. So how can we then bring that expertise and working together, you know, to make sure, you know, that we reach people with the supplies and the goods, you know, they need, you know, so that they become also active members of the economy. And I think, coming back to the point of all of us wanting to do good for humanity, I think private sector also has a big interest in having a healthy people, you know, that can be their clients, you know, healthy customers, you know, that can have a purchasing power, you know, to maintain the economy, but also more importantly, to contribute, you know, in a manner that those who work in the private sector also feel, you know, that they are contributing, you know, to the well-being of society and their customers also can identify themselves with the company or a product that is doing good, you know, rather doing bad. All of that, you know, combined, you know, could be a win-win situation. But it requires, you know, that we all get a little bit more humble than we used to be. I think that arrogance, you know, of, you know, just, you know, getting out there and then plowing through either for profit or that arrogance of wanting to come, you know, with my message or with, uh, my prescription, you know, to change, you know, the behavior, you know, all of that, you know, will take us, you know, one step back to see how can we build trust? How can we build respect? How can we accompany people rather than assisting them? How can we let them be part of the solution rather than seeing them always, you know, as a problem? How can we incentivize, you know, the market and incentivize, you know, people also with their purchasing power? And that is the reason why, you know, now we're doing more and more cash transfer programs, you know, for example, mm -hmm. and, you know, the private sector will bring the goods where it is needed and people can have a choice and a decision 
to what they're going to be buying and what they need in this particular moment. And that is all, you know, very critical, you know, ways of doing business differently. And where it is happening, we will see the difference it is making, not only in the lives of the people who are concerned, but also for the benefit of all the participants and actors in that field, public, private, as well as humanitarian actors. That's a very good answer. And then a uh, final question, how do you see the world in humanitarian development in the future? Well, the, it will all depend you know, on uh, the um, ability of uh, leaders to find solutions to problems of people. So there is a, a time today where I must say there is some kind of a breakdown in leadership in a way that uh, we are not you know, finding solution to the problems that are most acute. There are so many conflicts that are going on and on and on, and you know, that incapacity to stop it, it is simply unacceptable. It gotta stop. Hmm. You know, people cannot be continue to be bombed on a daily basis and then millions of people be put on the move and the needs growing and growing that cannot go on, you know, that could stop. You know, we are also experiencing a situation of violation, you know, of rights and then this prospect of human life is getting at a point that could stop, that is totally unacceptable. So we have to go back to the fundamental principles, you know, that are, you know, uh, the basis of humanitarian action. It is to be, uh, focusing on humanity, do it in a neutral way, in an independent way, in an effective way, but also volunteering each of us you know, in our capacity, be it with our ideas, be it with our workforce, you know, be it you know, simply to be there, you know, right you know, to the communities. And if we do that, then we will reduce the needs. If the needs are reduced, then we'll have less people to care for, and then if we have less people to care for, we'll have you know, making you know, a better, impact you know on the lives of the people and the lives of the communities you know all of us you know together now looking into the future so i may hope you know that uh, with education you know given uh, to children so they have you know a better perspective and better future including also in the crisis situations so that they do not replicate the horrible thing that they have witnessed you know themselves it is also to reduce gaps and disparities because sometimes it is not only the poverty and the deprivation of people, but the inequalities that are creating the problem. And there are so many today between men and women, between the rich and the poor, between those in the urban settings and then in the rural settings, between this generation and the next one. And that reduction of the gaps, you know, uh, supported by leadership that is committed to finding solutions to the problems of the people will give us a better future, and that is that better future that we are working on today, because it is not about hoping for it or, you know, making a prospective analysis of it. The question is, what do we need to do today to have the future we want to tomorrow? And we believe that by building resilience of people and working in partnership, communicating hope, and then being in true humanitarian action and imperative will be a contribution of today for a better future tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please join me in very um, good uh, applause to Mr. El Haj Asi. A very wonderful message from Mr. Asi that we need to do it now. And we start today by joining this session. And hopefully, this will give you an insightful uh, information about what the IFRC has done in response to humanitarian and development in the world. And now we're going to open Q&A sessions. Um, we're going to have one or two questions, uh, so we would like to open the session to all of you on the floor. Please state your name and the organizations you represented. Uh, maybe the committee can ask or help the floor to raise their hands or to um, state their questions. Yes. There's one at the front with the blue jacket. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, my name is Sheikh. Uh, I'm from India. I'm the founder of a real estate startup called HomePal. My question is, I heard another speaker at another conference who was also a humanitarian worker 
uh, he was quoting some numbers and it went like this. He said, if 400 of the world's top billionaires shell out 4% of the wealth, the world will not have poverty or most of the humanitarian problems. I'm not sure about those numbers, but the larger question is, how responsible are these wealthy billionaires and how outreaching are they? How responsive are they uh, to the issues around them happening around the world? That's number one. And question number two is, how supportive is the world media? And there are a lot of media people uh, here. So I was speaking to one of the uh, people from CNBC today, and I was just asking her, you know, how can I reach out to your uh, channel? I have a groundbreaking idea uh, that needs to be covered, you know? And she answered, you, ne you need to email, and if the panel finds it sensational enough, or, you know, if it is really breaking, so, that's the thing, you know, he was talking about the war in Iraq still going on. Uh, maybe there is no sensation anymore. Uh, um, so, uh, so with Afghanistan. So how responsible is the media in portraying the reality and the real sufferings of the people around the world uh, who need the attention desperately? Okay. Uh, your take on that. Thank you for the questions. Thank you. Thank now you. I will um, leave Mr. El Hajj Asi to answer the questions. But those questions are for Mr. El Hajj Asi, right? Not to me, because I'm a media worker as well. Uh, okay, so Mr. El Hajj Asi, please answer the questions. Yes, uh, I mean, we, we can cut the numbers in different ways. But, you know, some realities is that if you take, you know, 10 the richest people in the world, you know, may own anything between. 70 to 80 percent of the wealth, you know, in the world, you know, you can cut it, you know, in different numbers, but it communicates, you know, simply put, one thing, you know, which is a, you know, the inequalities and the disparities that I was talking about, and that cohabitation, you know, is deadly, and in that cohabitation, nobody is safe. I think, you know, there is nothing safe, you know, uh, for a billionaire, you know, to be surrounded, you know, by, you know, a million people who are hungry and to have to try to develop strategies, you know, for survival. And then this, there's nobody safe, you know, in such an environment. And that's why inequities, you know, must be addressed. And it has not, doesn't have to, you know, wait to be a billionaire to do that. I mean, it can happen, you know, already, you know, at every level, you know, going all the way, you know, up, you know, to the ladder. But, you know, you will also have, you know, governments and then states that have to intervene and also have, you know, policies, you know, as well as, you know, practices that will be devoted, you know, to responding to the needs of the people and distribution of wealth, you know, taxation, and then investment, you know, in infrastructure. You know, people then have to satisfy, you know, their basic needs, you know, like, you know, having the decent schools, you know, access to water, sanitation, hygiene, and, you know, health. You know, that is that is kind of a level, you know, that you know, we are talking about. And this, you know, again, you know, has to be done, you know, at all level. And it can be at an individual, you know, level, at an institutional level. And institution, I mean all of them, be it private sector institution, be it religious institution, social institution, as well as government institution. And we humanitarian intervene as one actors, you know, among many, you know, towards, you know, that same goal. So, so that is an appeal that I think we can all share and then see you know, how we can you know, work together toward it. You know, on the media, yes, uh, they, they can uh, play a very, very important role you know, indeed. And uh, I'm glad you know, to having a major person here that is uh, already an actor you know, sharing with us you know, the same commitment so that we can have this kind of a session. But fact of the matter is, if you had somebody who came on Earth from a different planet on one morning and then just you know, uh, read the media or check on the TV in the first hour on Earth, then that person would believe that, you know, planes are not taking off, they all only fall down. You know, the person, you know, will not believe that, you know, cars are driving, they only have accident. They don't feel that people are not talking to each other, but they only kill each other. And that is what the kind of a sensation that you were talking about. So the, you know, the, the, the search, you know, for sensations and then for bad news, you know, to make it, you know, news, and then good news not being a news, it is a reality within which also we live. But it is now, 
in times you know, where really we are facing so many challenges that you know, call for a certain level of, I think, responsibility, I would say, you know, to inform, to inform right, and then to inform also in a sensitive and a respectful you know, manner that is also, I think, a growing need that you will see also you know, some leadership being exercised you know, in the media you know, itself. So the difficulty is we talk about media blanket or the humanitarian actors blanket, but of course, you know, there's a lot of differentiation, you know, within it. And again, here the bout is what kind of a partnership can we build with those who are investing and are invested in the same type of perspective and work, you know, that we do towards the same goal. And by so doing, building the, great, the critical mass which is required and then influence others, you know, to be joining, you know, in the same field. So I'm looking at, you know, my host here and then hope that we need that leadership in that regard, and I'm glad that we also can count you among those. Thank you for the answer, Ms. El Hajj Asi. Um, now, uh, for the next questions, we still have time for one more? Nope? Okay. Um, I'm very sorry. I have to apologize that the committee says that we have an running out of time. Uh, but we are so glad that all of you are here today. And um, I hope this insightful discussion will be valuable for you and giving you a hope of the uh, new development, a new way of uh, solving the problems of humanitarian in the world today. And please, one more time, give a warm applause to Mr. Elhaj Asi.